Hey guys, I hope you're having a good night. So tonight I'm going to read a couple stories from the book called The Haunting of America. So sit back and enjoy because it's actually supernatural crime this time. Kimberly Padula awoke with a start, shaking uncontrollably. It was that dream again. She'd been having it since 1997, only now it was growing more intense. The faces were sharper, the smells more acrid, the details more frightening. In her vision, this bright and pretty young New York fashion designer saw herself wearing military fatigues as she grabbed and pulled people to safety in what appeared to be a sight that had been struck by a bomb. As she looked around her, there were many tanks rolling through the streets, soldiers and other official personnel in blue uniforms, while planes roared through the sky above. It was just like a war scene, she recalled. It looked to me like Armageddon. The dream was so real. Buildings were collapsing and crumbling as if they'd gone through an earthquake. They were just folding and falling. But I didn't seem to be a victim. I was helping victims. People were scared and I kept pulling them back into a bombed out area that had already been struck. Every several weeks, the underrained dream vision returned, sometimes even more vivid than the night before. Kimberly couldn't wake up panting, shaking with fright, the sounds of occasional cars and trucks just below her window only adding to her sense of disorientation. At the time, Kimberly was living in Manhattan's Little Italy, a small enclave of narrow but crowded streets and lots of family restaurants. Her small apartment was on the second floor of an old tenement, typical of the buildings that linked the streets in this old neighborhood. Kimberly was haunted by her reoccurring dream, so persistent and realistic that was that dream that one day she purchased a canvas bag in which she placed green army pants, shirts, boots, flashlights, and other safari gear. I put the bag behind my bed in the event I had to escape, although I had no conscious reason why I wanted to, she said. Kimberly's dream was especially ominous because ever since she was three years old, she had experienced what she called psychic feelings, an overpowering sense of intuition, intuition. The predictions she sometimes innocently made in school were not well received by peers. What are you, a witch? She was often asked. The frequent taunts caused her to retreat into herself, and so she kept her psychic gifts hidden. After attending the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York, Kimberly allowed her psychic sensitivity to emerge. By then, close friends were more accepting. Sometimes they believed me more than I believed myself, she admitted. In October 1999, Kimberly was convinced her reoccurring vision of disaster was a premonition. Not certain where to turn for advice, she asked a shaman she regarded as a father figure how he would interpret her dream. He told me something bad would happen, she said. The shaman added, you don't belong in New York. You are too sensitive. Although outwardly, Kimberly gave the appearance of being confident and in control. I felt physically like I was being pushed out of the city, she recalled. It was as if some bigger force was pushing me out. It was time to go. Kimberly decided to leave New York, where she'd been born and raised. She packed her belongings, some old, and shipped the remainder to California, where she'd only visited briefly on several, several earlier occasions. Her choice to fly to the West Coast was based simply on the fact that a girlfriend in California invited Kimberly to live with her. Friends and colleagues were surprised that I was suddenly moving, she explained. And they were afraid when I told them about my dreams of building buildings collapsing. For some reason, the buildings looked like mirrored glass. Kimberly arrived in Los Angeles in October 1999, expecting whatever disaster she dreamed of to take place the next year in 2000. She assumed because she was in California, the catastrophe would be an earthquake. Then, while living in Los Angeles, Kimberly had another vision in which she saw two tower cards. A part of the tarot deck, she paid little attention to the first dream. The second of the tower card sent her reeling around Labor Day of 2001. I freaked out, she said. Was an earthquake coming? Her ability as a clairvoyant or a sensitive could go no further in interpreting her persi persistent vision. vision. On the morning of September 11th, 2001, at about 4 a.m., Kimberly awoke suddenly with a sharp pang of anxiety. Not knowing what it meant, she uneasily returned to sleep. She learned of the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center in New York a few hours later when a neighbor banged on the door, woke her, and told Kimberly of the terrible tragedy. Not far from where she'd formerly lived and worked in Manhattan. At first, Kimberly did not recall her premonition about the terrorist disasters until a friend's phone call from New York that day reminded her. Only then did she associate her recurring dreams with the World Trade Center collapse. 
She, of course, devastated by the news of the many deaths, injuries, and destruction, as all Americans were. I was also surprised. It was confirmation to me that there was something psychic to what I felt and dreamed, she said. Asked why she thought she had premonitions about the terrorist attack, Kimberly answered, I don't know. I don't have all the answers, although I've had many psychic dreams. Today, Kimberly lives in Los Angeles, where she has since developed a practice as a professional psychic and sensitive at the urging of friends who benefited from her clairvoyant abilities. Kimberly Padula was not alone in experiencing premonitions about the World Trade Center assault, nor by any means was she the first to experience premonitions of disaster, either to individuals or to a collective. In fact, were Kimberly to have reported her premonitions 350 years ago in any of the New England colonies, she would have been declared a witch and sentenced to burn at the stake. Now we're going to get into the Salem Witch Trials. Life in the New England village of Salem in the Massachusetts Bay Colony as the year 1692 began was a harsh as bitter winter when it howled and beat against the clapboard houses. No Christmas or holiday festivities ushered in the new year because, according to strict Pur Puritan religious belief and law, those would have been regarded as frivolous and pagan practices. Salem had been founded in 1626, only six years after the pilgrims arrived to settle Plymouth and before the Puritans set foot there in 1630. With a royal charter received just a year earlier, their home in, new world, in the New World was now far from England, which they left in search of a place where they could practice their Calvinist religion as they saw fit, away from the domination of the Church of England, with whom they'd increased friction. They'd grown disgusted with what they felt were church corruption and straying from the purity they'd wish to see maintained in the Anglican Church. The Puritans who settled in New England had no intention of shedding either their unyielding Bible-based re religious convictions, including predestination, or occult fears that they tightly wrapped together as one democracy, as we know it. It was never much of a consideration, and separation of church and state was virtually non-existent. They were locked in the overcrossy, and their religious beliefs often inf influenced civil and political decisions. As god fearing Christians, the Puritans saw the devil as their arch enemy, whom they needed to be ever vigilant against, for Satan always lurked, ready to strike, anywhere, at any time. For the Puritans, fear and superstition held a firm grip. Life in Salem, as in the Puritan communities, was never easy. Hard work and prayer consumed most of one's time. There was the genuine dread of insufficient crops and food supplies, illness and epidemics, notably smallpox and infections. Indian attacks, as well as frequent squabbles and disputes between neighbors. For many of the religious and superstitious, the wrath of God was deemed responsible for nearly anything that went amiss, from inclement weather to the miseries of disease. Perhaps God-fearing, Puritans needed to be more prayerful to improve their fortunes when the thinking of the time. Underlying many of the Puritans' problems was a feeling of helplessness and terror of the unknown. That uneasiness and anxiety created the perfect climate for seeking scapegoats, the eccentric, argumentative, demented, and elderly to whom nearly any affliction could be attributed. It was convenient to accuse them of being witches or sorcerers in league with the devil and his demons, even if it was irrational. There's no room for dissent. Two well-known instances of voices that spoke up in opposition to Puritan rigidity were theologian Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson a courageous woman whose opinions resulted in her being banished from Boston in 1638. She then moved to Rhode Island, founded by Williams two years earlier. Her strange opinions were not welcomed in the Massachusetts colony, she was told. While the adults and Puritan communities faced both imagined and genuine stresses, girls and boys were permitted few, if any, joys or freedoms associated with childhood. Youngsters were to be seen and not heard, obedient, industrious, and prayerful. Boys were taught the skills they would ultimately need as adults, hunting, farming, and building. They learned to read and write so they could comprehend the Bible, the holy word of God. Girls, on the other hand, were not required to be literate. It was sufficient for them to just learn sewing, cooking, and other domestic skills. Little else broke up the monotony of their days and nights. Nathaniel Hawthorne later wrote in the Scarlet Letter that Puritan childhood was grim. Not surprisingly, the tedious lives of the Puritan children encouraged boredom especially during the long and dreary winters. In turn, the tedium led to mischief that was responsible for America's first major paranormal incident, the witchcraft hysteria of 1692, begun by several young girls in Salem Village who apparently 
Innocent curiosity about the occult spun wildly out of control. The beliefs in witches who could carry out Satan's evil deeds was as real to the Puritans as the constant threat from the devil himself. The Bible admonished, Thou shall not suffer a witch to live. And the Puritans took words literally. In England, witchcraft had been a crime punishable by death since 1542. By 1647, witchcraft was against the law in the New England colonies of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, where there were witchcraft outbreaks at various times. A witch's spell cast on livestock might make an animal ill or die. Witches in league with the devil even had the power to deform or kill newborn babies. According to Puritan conviction, ignoring high infant morality rates and an inappropriate look, pointed finger, or imprudent word might be construed as an evil curse. In 1655, Anne Hibbins, a quarrelsome Boston widow, seemed to know that two women were talking about her. Perhaps she'd overheard them, or she had a degree of genuine psychic or intuitive ability. Whatever the explanation, the women were certain that Mr. Hibbins' pre-science represented something occult and therefore dangerous. She was charged with witchcraft, tried, found guilty, and hanged the next year. In Hartford, Connecticut in 1662, a woman named Anne Cole suffered strange fits, marked by wild behavior. A minister who observed her wrote that Cole's bodily motions were extremely violent. Cole also confessed she heard strange voices, a phenomenon that, in the 17th century, was evidence of evil or demonic spirits at work. Today, of course, she would be given psychiatric treatment, but in the words of her day, she did have familiarity with the devil. Another of the accused in Harvard, an elderly and uneducated woman named Rebecca Greensmith, confessed to her acquaintance with the devil and acknowledged that he used my body. Her description of sexual intercourse with the devil was not unusual in the European history of witchcraft. However, her story is rare among New England accounts. The sexual aspects of witchcraft centuries ago were common, especially among those classified as heuristics. What is involved is apparently an erotic fit in which the woman actually goes through the motions of copulation and achieves an orgasm. Similar fits have been observed in mental patients in the 20th century. Author Chadwick Hansen wrote in Witchcraft in Salem. Found guilty of witchcraft, both Rebecca and her husband Nathaniel Greensmith went to the gallows in 1663, a year in his history of New England witchcraft where there were flare-ups of witch hysteria in several communities. The worst, an outburst that sent panic through Hartford, Connecticut. What was unique about Salem Village to bring the devil there? For one thing, unlike larger towns such as Boston, which had grown more sophisticated, Salem Village did not have a cosmopolitan or well-educated crenzy, even though it was only about 30 miles north of Boston. Salem Village must also be distinguished from nearby Salem Town, a more tolerant environment. Salem Village, now called Danvers, was, in one historian's word, a backwater. This small rural community with an adult population at that time of 215 was beset by friction and quarrels between various factions, fermenting enough hostility and jealousy for it to become the perfect place to incubate a witchcraft outbreak. The Salem Witch Hysteria, as it came to be called, began ironically in the home of the Reverend Samuel Paris. He'd been pastor of the Salem Village Church only since 1689, and although relatively inexperienced, he was considered as pious and strict as any Puritan minister could be, and in 1692 would prove to be a year unlike any he could have imagined in his worst nightmares. In the Paris household lived the Reverend, his wife, their nine-year-old daughter Elizabeth, his 11-year-old niece Abigail Williams, Anne Tichuba, and her husband John Indian, a West Indian slave couple. The Paris home served as a local personage. Elizabeth and Abigail had been fully indoctrinated in the Puritan faith with its fear of the devil, demons, and witches. How could it be otherwise in such a religious home? The girls were often left in the care of Tichuba with the idle time on their hands and owing young restless minds. The children were eager to hear the tales of Tichuba told of her culture so vastly different and unimaginable from their limited Puritan world. West Indian traditions held belief in voodoo, ghosts, necromancy, and magic all to Calvinist or Puritan tenets. Tichuba's skills, other than a domestic servant, included fortune-telling, sorcery, and palmistry. So in secret, Elizabeth and her cousin Abigail huddled in the kitchen of the Paris residence near the hearth, where Tichuba would enthrall them with tales of the supernatural and occult, she told which, with such an intensity that the children found them exciting, perhaps all the more so because they were forbidden. 
It wasn't long before the other girls in the village village quietly joined Elizabeth and Abigail to hear Tituba's story, storytelling and demonstrations of fortune telling and palm reading. Now the children had something to look forward to that was both secret and captivating. Of course, had their parents discovered what their daughters were learning, they would have been mortified, branded Tituba's behavior as absolute heresy, and punished her severely. Sometimes Tituba's tales of the occult were tinged with evil, something with that would arouse the wrath of any responsible Puritan parent. The hidden gatherings generated excitement, but also produced feelings of fright, guilt, and even sinfulness in the children who'd gone way beyond the boundaries of accepted Puritan teachings. Her stories proved difficult for naive Puritan children to safely absorb in a provincial community in which everything they learned from the young West Indian woman was a contradiction to the indoctrination of home and the church. The first sign of any serious problem occurred when Elizabeth and Abigail began displaying a peculiar behavior. They gazed emptily at the ceilings above and seemed to be experiencing strange muscular contractions, twitches, and fits. What was happening? Reverend Paris and his wife, although shocked and deeply concerned, had not the slightest idea. As quickly as they could, they summoned the village doctor, William Griggs, for his advice. While Reverend and Mrs. Paris waited, they resorted to what were then considered traditional solutions in such situations, prayer and fasting. Once Dr. Griggs arrived, he tried to determine the nature of the girl's distress. It was a while before he solemnly issued the disturbing conclusion. The girls, he said, have been afflicted by witchcraft. The evil hand is upon them, he stated earnestly. As troubling as the doctor's finding was, it was not an unusual one in the 17th century, when most physicians accepted witchcraft as a valid explanation for certain maladies, so it could be blamed for the girls' fits and other inexplicable symptoms. Of course, skeptics point out that, in addition to misdiagnosing hysterical disorders, medical doctors of that time had limited scientific knowledge and might explain away any illness they could not understand or treat by conveniently blaming witchcraft or demonic possession. But if one accepted that young Elizabeth Paris and her cousin Abigail Williams were the victims of a witch who afflicted them, then it meant that someone right here in Salem Village was working for the devil. According to popular belief, witches were nearly always women, and they were agents of the devil, agreeing to carry out his evil deeds. This was the same fearful and superstitious mindset that had convulsed Europe into centuries of thousands of witch burnings and the torture of innocent people. In America, as in Europe, the battle came down to God versus Satan, and the Puritan theocracy never had any doubt about whose side it was on. But caught now in the grip of fear and guilt were two young girls suffering from the psychological effects of witchcraft and the occult in an age where hysteria was not well understood medical condition. The display of physical symptoms could only be interpreted as within the limitations of Puritan thought and belief. Some would claim the girls were acting, but it is almost certain that Elizabeth and Abigail were highly impressionable and believed strongly in what the devil, magic, and witchcraft could do to hurt them. Thus, Fright caused them to descend into a genuine state of hysteria. In addition, as news of the girl's mysterious condition galloped through the community, the affliction seemed to spread, and there were soon complaints of similar symptoms reported by several other girls. Dr. Gritz had inadvertently fanned the flames of fear when he could not provide a better medical diagnosis for Elizabeth and Abigail. His conclusion that an evil hand is on them was crystal clear. Everyone in Salem Village understood that meant that children were victims of witchcraft. One common symptom at the time was a choking sensation in the throat, wrote Chadwick Hansen. The hideous convulsive fits were thought to be the result of witches and demons wrenching the bodies of their victims into torturous, torturous postures. Modern medical science recognizes convulsions as a component of the hysterical state. Senses were also affected. Difficulty seeing, hearing, speaking, lack of appetite, even memory loss were all believed to be the result of Satan's evil actions. The phenomenon of the throat contractions, or globus erectus, was also considered the work of demons to force the innocent to ingest supernatural or occult poisons. Some victims of witchcraft suffered abdominal bloating. In other instances, demons were blamed for skin eruptions or other external injuries. What caused hysterical symptoms may not have been actual witchcraft, but certainly the dread of it. The Reverend Paris had a copy of Cotton Mather's well-known book about witchcraft, memorable provinces relating to witchcraft and possessions. It was a topic New Englanders, especially Puritans, spoke about, albeit cautiously, and the Reverend Mather was to play a significant role in the Salem story. Religious leaders were highly respected and well-paid in Puritan New England, and Cotton Mather was the pride of the New England Puritism, wrote H.W. Brands. He was the son of the well-known Reverend Increase Mather, 
who led Boston's second congregational church and was the first president of Hartford College. Born in 1663, Cotton, a brilliant child, only 12 years old when he attended Harvard, and 22 when he was ordained. By age 25, he was the minister of Boston's North Church, the largest congregation in the Massachusetts colony, and became a strong and outspoken proponent of Puritan belief and theology. During his life, Cotton Mather wrote, publishing and remarkable 450 books and pamphlets, mostly about religion. With his Puritan contemporaries, Mather perceived the cosmos as a battleground between good and evil, explained Brands. That there is a devil is a thing doubted by none but such as are under the influence of the devil. When Salem seemed to fall under Satan's spell, Mather had no cause. By the bounds of the Puritan reasoning, no doubt the authenticity of events, the devil and evil entities were genuine. He spent years gathering reports of the occult and supernatural incidents, especially those he considered contradictory to his beliefs. For example, in 1688, the children of John Goodwin, a Boston stonemason, became victims of witchcraft in the hands of a woman named Miss Glover, whose daughter worked as a laundress for the Goodwin family. When Glover's daughter was accused by one of the Goodwin children of stealing linens, Glover gave 13-year-old Martha Goodwin a ton lashing laced with profanities. After the confrontation, all four Goodwin children were inexplicably afflicted with strange convulsive seizures, wrote Alice Dickinson in the Salem Witchcraft Delusion, 1974. The case drew attention of Reverend Mather, whose conclusion was that Martha was afflicted by hellish witchcraft. After he prayed with the girls, the youngest child, age seven, recuperated. Mrs. Glover's fate was sealed when she confessed to being a witch with magic powers. She even spoke to the devil at her trial. Not surprising, she was sentenced to the gallows. But even after Glover was hanged, the good wooden children still displayed their strange affliction. After more praying with Mather, they seemed to return to good health. That his help proved effective was not surprising. Puritan clergy were considered very successful in healing the demonically possessed. Mather was convinced... He'd been a witness to a genuine incident of witchcraft in which the devil could enter the home of a pious man like John Goodwin, Dickinson added. In 1689, Mather published his collected bindings in a book titled Memorable Provinces Relating to Witchcraft and Possessions. The popular book focused largely on the Goodwin story and influenced the thinking of many colonists, especially the Puritans. In Salem Village, Mather's impact reinforced the belief that the occult, black magic, and witchcraft were genuine and negative intrusions into people's lives. The Reverend Samuel Paris was one of those who did not doubt the the learned Cotton Mather. But what else could Paris do for his young daughter and niece now except pray for them? He summoned several other ministers, and they also offered sincere and fervent supplication for the afflicted girls. But Elizabeth and Abigail seemed to worsen. Their convulsions grew more intense. The girls' bodies became oddly contorted, that stiffened. Their breathing was labored, and they cried loudly, complaining of sudden pains. Anyone who saw their torment had no doubt they were observing witchcraft at work. The devil and his handmaidens were obviously busy in Salem, adding another alarm to an already stressed community. There was an important and obvious question that had to be addressed if the devil was to be confronted and thwarted. Who was working for Satan right here in Salem Village? In other words, who'd bewitched Elizabeth and Abigail? 